Welcome across Australia to this presentation on writing for business. My name is Dante St. James, presenting from a motel room in Brisbane today. And hopefully, wherever you are in Australia, this will be really helpful as you continue to work on your business, not just in your business. Let's share that screen and get started. A quote straight away from Seth Godin, who's a bit of a thought leader in all things modern, all things business, and all things to do with the digital world, he says the reason business writing is horrible is that people are afraid, afraid to say what they mean because they might be criticized for it, afraid to be misunderstood, to be accused of saying what they didn't mean because they might be criticized for it. What this is all about is making sure that your communication with the public and your communication with people internally as well is really clear, concise, and very, very obvious what it is you're speaking to. It helps to, dis, uh, to, to disarm really conf conflict-heavy situations. It helps to calm down customers, and it helps you to be presented as someone who is calm, in control, so you can quit worrying about these people always trying to criticize you. Now, we're not necessarily talking about blog writing here today, although some of the principles can certainly fit into that. Some of the stuff we'll talk about with clarity will certainly cover that. What we're going to cover today is a little bit about audience and purpose. We're going to cover a little bit about clarity and conciseness. The C words are really strong in this one, and they're good C words. And we're going to look at problem words and phrases that you can sort of work your way around and do a better job of using or eliminating completely to help you to communicate more clearly through the written word as part of your business. We're going to concentrate quite heavily on reactive and proactive ways of communicating with your clients and with the industry and the world in general. This is brought to you by Business Station and the Australian Small Business Advisory Services Digital Solutions Program, brought to you by Business Station in WA, Regional Development Australia Brisbane in Queensland, and Treaty Business Consulting in the Northern Territory. You can view this again later on via Business Station's channel on YouTube. I'll also be presenting it to my own YouTube channel and through the various channels such as LinkedIn and Instagram and Facebook and all those guys on my own channels a little bit later on as well. You can catch those at the end of this particular presentation. A little bit about me before we get underway. If you've not met me before, and I know lots of people have through this ASBAS Digital Solutions Program, um, I originally was a doctor educated through Western Sydney University, then went on very many years later after not really liking being a doctor, becoming someone who was then something more interesting in marketing and a lot heavier interest in business systems. So I did um, further education and a master's in business information systems and marketing at the University of New South Wales. I worked a lot with the Chartered Institute of Marketing out UK through their remote study options, obviously. Otherwise, it's still probably over there. You know what they do with Australians over there? Just suck them into the system and never let them come back. And then the TAFE New South Wales have got a bunch of certifications. But my biggest work in this past couple of years has been through the various programs that I've been uh, contracted to take part in. Facebook's Blueprint Lead Trainer Network across the world and their Community Trainer Network within Australia, also as a digital marketing associate for small businesses for Facebook Australia and a media planning professional and media buying professional to help get so much more out of those ad platforms. With Google's Digital Springboard Program and three uh, major uh, Australian small business support uh, uh, programs, such as Be Connected, which is for older Australians to get them online, the Australian Small Business Advisory Services Digital Solutions Program, which we're actually on right now, and the NICE program, the new business assistance through the new enterprise incentive scheme, which is delivered by the Australian government's jobs and training. So let's start off with a little bit about audience and purpose and how these are going for you. And by the way, as we're getting on the, on the way too, feel free to use the Q&A and the chat. I will see them come up. I just can't put them on my screen to see exactly what's going on at all times. We've only got the one little screen that I'm working with right here at the moment. But if you do have questions, please do put them through. I'd love to be able to answer them or at least point you in the right direction if I can along the way. So the first thing we need to be is answering the question of what we, are wanting to be learning from a document. 
So we want to find out as we're going to any sort of document, whether it's an email, whether it's um, you know, some kind of report that you're writing, whether it's a social media post even, is to ask the question, who am I writing for? That is so vital because it's going to color everything about the content that's to come, the language, the tone, the color that's in your language, the way that you discuss things, the information you bring in is all going to be because you've answered these two questions. Who am I writing for? And why am I writing this? And that moves on, I guess, to working out who your audience is, is about who you're writing for. Because you've got to work out who it is is going to be ultimately reading this stuff. If you're just posting stuff out of social media all the time or sending spammy emails out all the time and you haven't done the pre-work to work out who it is that your audience is, then you haven't answered that initial question. Who exactly is the person you're writing this for? Who's the person who's going to benefit from that information? And also then where you are using appropriate tone for different kinds of readers, for different kinds of people, you need to answer the other question, which is why am I writing this? Am I writing this to convince them? Am I writing it to reply to them? Am I writing it to reach out to them? Or am I entertaining or informing or educating? What's the purpose of why I'm writing this as well? So once you've got those two things like kind of leaked, you're ready to go to the rest of it. All writing for business involves pretty much four different goals, starting off with being effective at achieving some kind of goal, some kind of objective that you got out there that you want to achieve. So you're not writing for the sake of writing. If you're doing that, you probably need to stop it. No one, no company, no business was just going to write because it's fun, unless they're copywriters and it's their business. You're writing to achieve some kind of purpose. You're writing to be maybe informative for the audience you're sending it to. You want to give them some information or some education on a particular type of topic. You may be writing to be responsive, to get some sort of response from someone else, or you are responding to someone else. The example could be that it's a government that's been criticized over something, and then they will write a press release or host a press conference where they answer those questions or have some kind of response. You may also be writing to be persuasive, to help you get a sale or some kind of decision. It could be even in the form of hiring new staff. You could be writing to be persuasive to get someone to go through the trouble and the hassle of wanting to go through the interview process with your particular company. Now, knowing your audience means that you essentially don't talk to everyone the same way. Um, in this day and age, we're often thought to be um, very much about being neutral. The problem with being neutral is you never actually speak to anybody. I was like the emperor's new clothes was that fable from our childhoods where when you try to please all, you end up pleasing absolutely no one whatsoever. Everyone was saying you should wear this, you should wear this. So he said, I will wear this thing which pleases absolutely nobody. When you try to please all, you please none. And that's the same with knowing an audience understanding who you're writing this for because you don't talk to your boss the same way you talk to your closest friends. You don't talk to your closest friends the same way you talk to your mother. Well, at least I hope you don't. Otherwise, you might have some problems. You won't talk to the guy next door the same way you will talk to your great aunt Phyllis. There's different ways you're going to communicate and that's why you need to know who you're writing for. So in business, what you're going to do, you're going to write your content and match the kind of people who are going to read it. If it's a young, uh, young guy still in high school who's um, cocky and confident about his prospects in the world, then you'll write to him in a way that reflects where he's at. If they're young professionals out in the workforce or in their 30s who are you know, um, in, the, in the home buying period, in the first kids kind of period where they're trying to consolidate their careers rather than just rise up the ranks, you will speak to them in the language that they understand. Generation Z, millennials, and then going right through the baby boomers and Generation X, but you speak to them a completely different way as well. Um, I always find it really weird when someone says to me, calls me sir, and I'm like... I'm not a sir, or they call me Mr. St. James. Like Mr. St. James is my dad. I'm not those things. So sometimes there are outliers like myself who don't fit their generation. I'm not a boomer. I'm a generation X, but I don't tend to fit the narrative or the communication style. And I don't receive your communication the same way that most people within my age do. But there are certain generalizations that are going to be very common across certain demographic groups. You will certainly not speak to someone who's 20 years old and moving to Adelaide for their first foray into the great wide world um, 
the same way you talk to someone who's lived there for 50 years and knows the place inside out. The context is different. The audience is different. The generational and cultural influences and references are going to be completely and utterly different. So here's some characteristics of your audience you might want to consider to make that decision much easier. Consider how many people you're writing for. Is it for a group? Is it for one person? Is it for two people? Is it being written with a BCC on the email going to your boss as well so you can make sure you're ticking a box and crossing a T? Now, in this day and age, I know we're trying to be very, very neutral when we do things, but there, if there's a specific gender you're writing for, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing that you write it differently. It's just that if the content is completely, completely messed up and you're offering deals to one gender over the other, that's where it gets a bit messy. And that's where you're starting to make really poor decisions. But if there is a specific gender you're writing for, there's a specific, a specific language and tone you'll go. Particularly if there's cultural uh, differences between one gender and another or a cultural difference between one group of women and another or one group of men and another, you will then look at, okay, they're things I have to bring into consideration in the way that I'm going to communicate. And then also what the knowledge level is of your audience. There's no, there's no, no point going out there and doing a complete technical manual on how to pull apart your, your air conditioner and clean it out from the inside, including all the mechanical and electrical components that you need to clean and, and then service. If that person just wants to know how to keep their air conditioner cleaner for longer, you would just give them the basic ideas, the basic principles, and then say, at this point, you then need to call in an expert. So the knowledge level of your audience is going to very much determine the kind of content you're going to write as well. Then the characteristics you may want to consider is what your reader's issue of concern and start with it. So their issue of concern may be the set of traffic lights that's going to be put in at the end of their street, causing them great concern. Or it could be that they are a customer who may have had a bad experience, or they could be a customer who has stuck through thick and thin to work with you, despite, you know, at times considering leaving you, you would speak to them in a very different way as well. And also a characteristics you may want to consider is what their role in the organization is. So if you're writing to another business, um, you will write very differently to the CEO than you write to the customer service rep or to someone who's in the shop that you're responding quite casually to. Very different kinds of people, very different objectives you're setting out to achieve when you're dealing with those people and a de very different role that you're writing towards and also what your relationship with them is. You may know the CEO because you, you go to the, the bowls club with them on, on a Thursday night and or you know the person who is hiring you. So the the relationship is a little more casual than it normally would be if you go, dear sir, yours faithfully. And those um, very strong uh, relational characteristics we put or remove from mail and email in the past. So a little bit of research is going to go a long way if you don't know these things yourself. If you do not know what those characteristics are or the person at the other end or who's going to read it, this is when you do a little bit of research. And when I say research, I'm saying going into things like LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, wherever, wherever you're going to find um, some information about that particular person that you can reference in your communication. Now, this is the same with sitting down with having a meeting with them. It's the same with writing a letter to them or an email to them. The little bit more that you can know, the more you've got a chance to build a rapport. Now, I'm not saying going stalking them and then digging through their, their back catalog of everything they've ever done in their life on Instagram. That just gets creepy and weird. But mentioning, oh, I noticed your kids go to school at Haleybury Rendell. My kids went there when they were younger as well. How are you finding it these days? It helps to create some kind of rapport without it being super creepy. Um, when you can draw common ground you can draw common references and common points of reference it makes it so much easier for people to be able to take you seriously and actually like responding to you so for an example kerry jones uh is the um the the the, the, the is that the development company now we don't know whether kelly kerry is a guy or a girl we don't know who we're speaking to, what kind of role Kerry's in. We don't know um, what generation Kerry's in. We don't know anything about Kerry. Uh, we don't know their role in the organization. We don't know whether they're a manager. We don't know how they fit with things and we don't know them. So we can't sort of bring in references for it. 
So what we would do, we would have to then go and go, who is Kerry Jones? We may go to LinkedIn to find out that Kerry Jones is actually a man. Great, I know that now. You know that Kerry Jones through LinkedIn is listed as the CEO of that particular organization. So we know then that our particular tone with our writing is going to be just that little bit different than what it was if we were just going through a customer service rep. So once we look at all those different factors and how they fit together, remembering that in those ones, they are very much about how many people you're writing for. Are you writing to Kerry or are you writing to Kerry's entire cast of thousands? Um, is there a specific gender? Do we know that Kerry's a man or a woman? We now know that Kerry's a man. What is the knowledge level of this audience? Well, it's about this guy's company. He's going to know all about it. When we know what the reader's issue or concern is. So for instance, if we're writing to them um, in response, knowing what their concern will be. So it'll be for saving face for the company. We know to come at them with that particular thing in mind. What their role in the organization is, Kerry is the development manager or the, or the, the vice president of a particular area or the director of a particular part of the company. And what your relationship with them is, you don't know Kerry, you have no prior relationship. So the approach is going to be a little bit less casual and more formal. Now, Sonia Simone, who's um, the CEO of Copy Blogger, which is a great source of um, information through podcasting, um, through learning how to write better copy and learn to write. I've taken a lot of her um, cues here on, on how to write better for business. Says a proposal is six times more likely to be considered if it's written for its intended audience. And that is a huge deal. That means that writing something that's general and generic for just any old person to be able to read, like I said before, you try to please all, you end up pleasing nobody at all. And how we're going to do this, and I've got a very much a step-by-step -step process we're going to go through that helps. I'm just framing it all up for you now so you understand the kind of approach we're going to take. Now, we also need, now that we know who we're writing to, we need to know what our purpose is for writing to them. What is the end goal we've got in mind? If you want to be effective, you need to be clear about what the point is of what you're writing. You need to answer that question, why am I writing this? So spend a little time to work out your purpose because it'll help you to stay very much on topic when you kind of ramble a bit. I know when I write and when I talk, I can kind of waffle a little bit and go off in the other directions and what they call going off in tangents. You want to keep within context. You want to lead towards where your main points are because you're either selling something to them or you're answering something to them or you're doing something with them that makes a lot of point, uh, lots of um, a lot of a lot of sense to you, but may not make so much sense to them if they don't have that framing in place. And that you help get the reaction that you're actually looking for, whether it's a yes, sign me up, or it's a yes, let's make an appointment, or a yes, I will buy that from you. Whatever the purpose is of your particular communication with someone, you want to make sure you get the reaction you're looking for at the end of it. So if you don't know your purpose, and you're not really sure about that before you start writing it, well, number one, don't start writing yet. Make sure you work out the purpose. And you do it by saying, why am I writing this particular piece? Why am I writing this document, email, letter, or proposal? Why? What am I trying to achieve? And what do I want the reader to do about it or know because of what they just read? So I'll just repeat that. Why am I writing this document or this letter or this email, or whatever it happens to be? And what do I want the reader of that letter to do? Do I want them to um, go to my website? Do I want them to buy something for it? Do I want them to call me? Do I want them to think? Do I want them to vote for something? Do I want them to join a club? Whatever the reason is, you've got to answer that question. Why I'm doing it? And it's because I'm, I'm doing a sale. I'm trying to sell memberships to the local cricket club. And what do I want the reader to do? I want them to go to the website and join the cricket club. Simple, right? Now, there are three very, very different kinds of writing and very different reasons for writing. The first kind of writing is to inform someone of something. The second is to respond to something or to get a response from something. And the third is to persuade. That's like a sales letter at the end. We're going to go through each one of these and give you the structure of how each of these work that helps you to be a much more effective writer and to elicit the kind of responses you want to get from these particular kinds of activities. So first up, if you want to inform, that could be in the form of something like an email to your employees or to your contractors to let them know about something that's changed in the workplace. Let's say, for instance, new parking arrangements in the street. 
It could be a newsletter to your clients, letting them know that your premises has been certified to be COVID-19 safe. So that kind of thing, very informational, important information to get out, compliant information that needs to get out. Or it could be a letter to the local business association or chamber of commerce to confirm that your contact details have changed and here's the new contact details to let them know what those things are. An informational one is sending something out to inform someone of something changing or something that they should know or something that there might be interesting for them to know about you or your business. Now, when you're talking about things that are written to respond, we're talking about the answer from a customer about a product or a service. So they've come to you to inquire about a product or a service. And this is you answering that question or quest set of questions that they've had. It could also be to thank an unhappy customer for their feedback or their complaint. It doesn't feel like you want to thank them sometimes because they're just being so whingy and whiny, right? Well, in this case, this gives you a structure that helps you to respond in the most respectful and constructive way. And also to confirm that you receive notice from your contractor that they won't be working today. So that could be like, okay, they're not working on building a pool today. Well, you know that and you've responded and you've been able to tell them. So to respond is coming back to someone who's initiated a conversation already with you. And then we go to the persuade part. This is where you might be writing text in a flyer. You might be writing text on your website. You might be writing a script for a new TV or radio ad or writing an email to a client to convince them to consider upgrading their service with you. Persuasive communication is generally associated with sales and marketing um, because it's designed to elicit a response from someone else. So whilst you are responding in the last one, this is where you're trying to elicit a response for the positive from someone who you're trying to usually to sell something to. And then sometimes you're going to have a little bit of all the above in that letter. So it could be, for instance, thanks for your inquiry. I'm sorry about the problem with our product. That's a respond. Our refund policy states that we cannot accept a return if the item has been worn. That's informing. And then finally, in the persuasion, you're going, this is to protect customer's health. However, I'd like to offer you a store credit to use. So you're using each one of those different styles of communicating, the response, the inform and the persuade in different parts of that particular conversation. They're very interchangeable. They don't sit on their own all the time. Sometimes something's just to respond. Sometimes it's just to inform someone or something. But then sometimes that email be going back to someone where you have to do all three of them in the one conversation. So you need to ask yourself before you write that message, am I informing? Am I responding or am I trying to persuade someone to do something? And this is the three main types of business communication you're going to have that's written. So let's start off with, am I informing the informational? So examples for writing to inform could be a new employee manual in your business, a quarterly report that you're writing, meeting minutes, the bane of every cord, oh, every every board or every um, every committee you might have been part of at some stage. It could be standard operating procedures. And if you're a small business, these things are something you're going to come across one day when you get that little bit too big to be able to do everything in your head and you have to transfer all that knowledge to someone else. You're going to be writing a lot of information down, a lot of writing that's designed to inform people. So whoever's reading these new facts, and that's usually what informational stuff is about new stuff, new information, new procedures, things that you need someone else to be able to learn and retain, then whoever is reading these has new facts to consider and you want them to take these facts on board. So the style of writing you're going to use is going to match that. So it's going to be something like, for instance, ensuring that the facts are received by being very direct about what the facts are being very clear about those, not being vague or, or contradictory in there, being concise. The quicker you can say it, he used to be in radio. And I remember the, um, the guy who I was um, writing ads for, he was my creative director, said, look, if you can't say it in 15 seconds, it's probably not worth saying. And that I've sort of taken forward with me in life to be very concise, use the right words to get the right message across and it will land the right way at the other end as well. To be neutral in tone doesn't mean being um, no having no passion. It doesn't mean you know not being yourself. Being neutral in tone means that you're reaching out to an unknown. That you may be responding to an unknown. You don't quite know who this person is, so you don't want to go in with 
full guns blazing of personality, personality, pow, pow, pow. Or you don't want to be so dead and so boring and so negative that just go away. I don't want to speak to you ever again. Please go away. Uh, you don't want to be either of those extremes. You want to be somewhere in the middle where there's a certain degree of friendliness in the voice that you're writing. And there's a certain degree of formality in what you're writing as well. But you also need to be accessible. And accessible goes beyond disability. It goes into... Um, people who may be neurodiverse and uh, may be on the autism spectrum, or they may have learning difficulties, which they need that very direct, very clear, very concise, and very neutrally presented information. So first of all, let's use an example, example where I bought a tripod from Wish, and I need to return it because there was, or not so much return it, but I need to inform the manufacturer that they got something wrong. So tell, I've got to tell my reader why I'm writing this email almost in the very, very start. So the subject line would say it all, errors in tripod instructions. Very clear what I'm writing about. And I go on to say, I've found some inconsistencies in the standard operating procedure that is supplied with the tripod I purchased on April 23. The images showing how to operate the tripod don't match the interface on the tripod itself, which is causing our clients to have difficulty using this tripod. So I've been very clear about why I'm writing this. I'm writing it because my clients have difficulty in using the tripod because there's something that doesn't match in the instructions. The instructions aren't right. So we'll continue. Now I'm going to organize my main points. Using dot points can be a really good way to make this very clear. In fact, dot points are going to become your best friend in all kinds of writing. They help you to organize your thoughts, organize your points, and makes it really easy for someone to understand what you're trying to say. So we continue. Examples of some of the inconsistencies include figure 2.1, the tripod shown is not the same as a tripod delivered. Figure 3.3, the written language in the figure appears to be Russian. However, the rest of the instructions are written in English. So you're getting a picture here of what you're getting. It sounds like a really bad trip to Ikea or something like that, where you're not quite getting the, the instructions right and the things aren't quite matching up to what they should be. So this is where we make it abundantly clear what it is. We've pointed to even the exact point, this exact figure. We haven't said something vague like the pages in the book have pictures that don't match. It's not making it easy for that person to solve that problem for you. Now, the facts and the accuracy of those facts is vitally important because it insists, it really assists with the person at the other end making an informed decision about how to act. It adds credibility to your message. You're not just coming in with emotion, emotion, emotion. My clients are screaming at me. It's all going terrible. You people are disgusting. I'm going to sue you in the highest court of the land. When you come in like that, immediately it just starts people shutting down. It's like, oh, here we go. All right. And then if you separate the facts from your opinions, what you're doing is allowing the facts to speak for themselves. So you're not adding your judgments onto those facts. Let's consider that the facts shown were figure 2.1. The tripod shown is not the same as the tripod delivered. That's a fact. Figure 3.3, the written language in this figure appears to be Russian. However, the rest of the instruction written in English. The facts are the tripod shown is not the same as the tripod delivered. The language isn't quite matching what language is in the rest of the instructions. Great. The opinion on that would be, I like your tripods. They're great, but your instructions need to be accurate. So I'm pointing out the facts very cleanly in those two points. And then I'll add my opinion later on. I don't have to go, this is awful because figure 2.1 shows the, the tripod shown is not the tripod delivered and that's really misleading. That just makes the whole thing confusing and means that there's some, you're taking someone on a, on a roller coaster ride of emotions of, oh, I'm trying to understand what this is, but they keep telling me how upset they are. And it makes it really difficult for people to make solid decisions to move forward with. Whereas you separate out the facts from your opinions then you've got a style of writing that is so easy to read, so easy to understand, and it will speed up the process of having things that you need fixed, actually fixed. Let's continue. Clarity is where you're going to learn to cut through the fluff and cut through all the surroundings and the, and the personality and the opinions and get to where the actual clear things is. 
So the clarity comes in the fact that you separate these facts and these opinions. When you start muddying the waters, you start mixing those things, you collapse in what the fact is with what your opinion is about that fact. And then it becomes this messy, muddy, wishy-washy, aggressive, passive aggressive mess that people find very difficult to deal with. And you will know this when you've received things that have haven't been particularly nice from your clients or from your customers where they've said, well, they've gone off on some kind of tangent and you get to the point where you go, I don't even know what they're trying to say anymore. I don't even understand. I need to go to bed and think about this in the morning because you can't quite unwind the opinions and the, and the, and the, and the hurt and the disappointment from the actual facts of what happened. Anyone who's got kids, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If only they come back to you and describe the facts of the thing that happened rather than the tear works and all the lies and all the, the, the stories made around things as well. Thankfully, in business, we can grow up a bit and we can present something in a much more clear way. Now, that was all about informing. Now we're going to move on to responding. This is the kind of writing which you would be doing when you have a customer inquiry. You want to respond to the customer inquiry. You want to um, communication from team members coming to you. You've got applications for people applying for a job with you, or you've got standard operating procedures that you've been asked to write. So let's look at this more closely. The purpose of this responsive writing is to keep your customers, your colleagues, your staff, your family even happy with you, right? You want them to be happy with you because happy customers are not high maintenance. Happy customers go on their way and you may never hear from them ever until something goes wrong. So responsive writing, its job is to clean up messes if there are messes to clean up. Now, responsive writing is very prompt and it's also very courteous. And there's a few generally agree to principles that come into play with how responsive and how prompt and how courteous you need to be. Prompt responses are usually within 24 hours. Responding within 24 hours to a request for a meeting, a request for a quote, not necessarily coming back with a quote, but at least responding to that request for a quote within 24 hours is pretty stock standard. That is a pretty good guideline to go by. Sooner though, if they're really upset. So for instance, I missed um, a, and this just happened literally just before this webinar, is that I completely in my busyness lost track of a particular client and where I was supposed to be working with them. Um, it just sort of slipped through the cracks because I wasn't checking up, I wasn't doing the right thing and I wasn't actually chasing up and putting the client first. Now, I took way more than 24 hours. It took two weeks, three weeks to actually get back to this client about their particular situation. Terrible, unforgivable, not a great piece of work on mine. So they came and um, and, and I saw I was CC'd into a response from them that I then responded to within an hour. In fact, I responded within five minutes and, and accept, accepted that I did the wrong thing. And said, look, I'm sorry, my, in my busyness, I have dropped this. I'm gonna take responsibility for that. Let's now get this back on the road. What, can you meet tomorrow at 11 o'clock? So that way I was responding when it was urgent because they, even though they didn't come across as being horrible and upset, I did the wrong thing. So I really needed to take a little bit of ownership of that and shift my day around a bit to accommodate them because they were quite gracious about me not getting back to them for three weeks. Now, why being prompt and courteous matters is because it shows to them that you take it seriously and it shows to them that you're professional. Now, professional may not be something that people claim they want to get all the time, but trust me, when you're not professional, they really, really miss it. Professionalism shows maturity. Maturity shows something that you can trust. If you've got a situation you need fixed, you want to be able to trust the other person on the other end of the line or at the other end of that email. So the reason why I was approached to that is because there was a certain level of trust between the person who they were complaining to and between that client. So I was able to go, there's a level of trust and I take it seriously. I will respond in a prompt and courteous manner. Part of that courtesy was accepting that I was wrong. Part of that promptness was going, this deserves to derail a couple of other things I'm doing right now. I really need to jump in and do this one right now. So an example could be handling a complaint. So this is the opposite of the one we were sending before where we were informing a company of a problem. Now we're the company being informed. So this is a complaint about our services. The subject complaint about your services. Dear Bridget, thanks for your feedback about your recent experience with our business. 
Now, all we're doing is starting off at the very beginning of thanking someone for their feedback. Now, this is, um, it's, it's often, now please excuse my French, I'm going to call it the shit sandwich because that's what I was introduced to it as. You start off with a, a very sweet start. So you just go at the very start at the top of the sandwich, I'm coming in with something which is very gracious. Then I go into the, the meat and the contents of it, and then I come back out and leave with a very positive as well. So it's quite often when you um, go through counseling in a workplace or in a business where you're having, say, a mentor who's mentoring you, they'll start off with, they'll say something great, then they'll give you the, the nasty, and they'll finish off with something great as well. So you walk out of there feeling like positive about the actions you need to take on the things that need actions taken on them. So we're going to start off with this complaint about the services by being very gracious where the, the, the start of the sandwich, let's call it the bun at the top. Thanks for your feedback about your recent experience with our business. Next, we're going to be very precise about what the issue that was that raised. Now, this might take some interpretation from our part, where we're actually pulling out of their email or through their conversation exactly what we understand. And there's a very, very common reason for this. Dear Bridget, thanks for your feedback about your recent experience with our business. The correct way to access our team services is via booking a, a booking made on our website at this address or via our phone number, which is through this. So I would say that this particular customer has some issues getting in touch with this particular company and they have gone about it in a way that the company didn't know that this customer was particularly trying to reach out to them and wasn't responding. It was through a channel that they maybe didn't monitor. Now, the, the ethics of all this would be, well, they should be monitoring all their channels because they're a company and they're dealing with their clients. Um, the real the realistic is that we can't be everywhere on every channel at every time. Not all of us are big enough and bold enough and rich enough to be employing a team of assistants to do that for us. So the correct way to access our team services is, about, is via a booking made on our website. So being very precise with an answer to the issue that was raised. This issue was, I couldn't find where to contact you. And I finally sent an email through HR because it's the only thing I can see to find on your website. So now we're going to add some more additional help, from, help and information that might be somewhat more helpful to that person at the other end. So as we've gone through the thanks for the feedback and we've told them the correct way to get in touch with us, we've said, I've also attached a PDF for you that gives you a range of ways that you can access our services online. So we've not just delivered the, um, the, the thanks for reaching out. We haven't just reached out and, and corrected the person that said, this is how you contact us. We've also provided a, a place that they can you know, save in their email and it's searchable and it's, um, they can bring out of all these different ways they can access this particular set of services online. They provided a bit more than what they had to, but they've made it so it's abundantly clear that you have now been given all the ways that are valid and available to be uh, dealing with our particular business. Now we switch over to being sincere or having a conversation that can be very helpful. So we've had the bit where we've said thank you. We've shown them the correct way of dealing with us. We've then also gone and sent them extra information. Now we're finishing off at the end by saying, I hope this is helpful. Thank you for considering working for us. So that's the, um, I'm not gonna, the crap sandwich, I'm going to call it, where it's the, it's the bad stuff in the center, which is correcting them and sending them the correct information, is sandwiched between a good thanks at the top and a hopeful uh, another thanks at the bottom. You're thanking, you're educating, you're thanking. It helps to... Uh, make the whole experience that little bit more pleasant and sweet for them. Now you're not sucking, no, there's no sucking up in there. So thanks for your feedback because you're a business. You need feedback. If your things are going wrong, you need to know about it. And you're thanking at the end for considering working with you because it opens up the possibility for them to still continue to work with you, even if they're a little bit upset. Now, being brief and concise is going to be a friend in this. Being brief doesn't mean being cold or abrupt. It doesn't mean being shutting people down. Being brief means just using the fewest words possible to get the message across in a way that is very, very clear. Excessive words are 
always going to waste time. They're going to make your life so much more difficult because the more words you put in there and the fancier words you put in there, the more that something could be misunderstood. I mentioned um, like one, one of the only things I ever took away from the Dianetics book, you know, the Scientology book that L. Ron Hubbard wrote that I ever took away from it. It's always sort of stuck in my mind ever since is this principle where if you don't understand something that you're reading, you should go back and read it again and again and again until you get it and then you move on. But otherwise, if you move on and you don't understand something and you go to learn more and more and more about that thing, you're taking a misunderstanding along the journey and it colors everything you're going to read down the track. Likewise, when you're using words that people have a lot of difficulty understanding, they're not going to understand it at that point and they're not going to get past it. They're going to get stuck there. They're not going to get onto the good, juicy, awesome content that you've got down in that particular website article, or they're not going to get to the great part of that letter that you've written to them or that email you've written because they're stuck on that stupid word you used and you decided to be really clever. Also, by being brief and not abrupt and not using excessive words, you get to stay very relevant and you get to stay very on topic. That's one of the things that can get so easy to do when you're writing an email is getting way, way off topic, going off in tangents that make no sense to whatever your central argument was and make no sense to the point that you're trying to get to at the end. When you're going around in circles and talking about you know, your grandmother and your great grandmother and the, when you went to get the glasses from spec savers and all you really need to do is say, I've been busy, then you're not helping your case. You're creating was just a story, creating stories around facts, then depositions your the effectiveness of your story and the credibility of your story as well. The more stuff you're adding on, the more like it looks like you're trying to overcompensate for something. So in the spirit of that, I'm going to stop that bit and move on. Clear, courteous, concise, and conversational is what you're looking for because it promotes trust. That was talking about credibility. The less words you say, the more effective those words are, the more credible you become. And it promotes an in-kind response. If you come to someone in a really good, solid way of saying, thank you for, for, for being our customer and letting us know this, 0.1, 0.2, 0 0.3 in brief terms. And thank you again for reaching out. If there's anything we can do, please let us know it lets them come back in an in, in kind response with you rather than ranting and, sh and yelling down Twitter or you're ranting and yelling down a Facebook message. They come back in the spirit. We as humans, part of our empathetic response and our sympathetic response is that if we're approached aggressively, we will respond aggressively. If we are approached with a smile, we respond with a smile. Look at the way a baby goes, right? With, with its first, uh, first steps. Um, if you're smiling up, well, well, actually one of the best ones is when a baby falls over, right? When I've, I tested this on um, the, the kids of uh, some friends of mine many, many years ago. And when the baby becomes a toddler and starts to walk and they fall over and they, if you go kaboom and laugh and smile with them, they learn that, oh, okay, that's, that's, that's actually part of this learning and, and it's okay that I've fallen over. If they fall over and you go around, oh, Bubba, you fall over, oh, you poor thing, oh, then you're actually teaching to be afraid of taking that step and reinforcing behavior excuse me, reinforcing behaviors that are not going to be good for them to continue to learn. I'm not a pediatric specialist, so please don't accept my parenting um, advice there. It's just something I tested out because, you know, it's something I read in a magazine once and I thought that was a really cool thing and it worked on those kids. So what it does though, this clear, courteous, concise and conversational attitude moves you onto the next item of your day. Ever notice how you get one bit of bad feedback in the, in the, in the start of the day and it makes the rest of the day a write-off? You basically can't move past it. You're, you're stuck in this bad feedback. You're stuck in the aggression and you think, oh, how am I going to respond? How am I going to say this? When you just break it down to being that, 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 yes, no, yes, or the like, dislike, like, or the, 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 the crap sandwich, you're then able to move on. You provided a nice start. You provide the information that needs to be, needs to be communicated. You've had a great finish. It provides you with closure. That closure is vital for you to move on. If you've ever worked in customer service, you know what I'm talking about. Getting that closure moves the person on to the next stage so you can serve the next person coming through. Now, the third type of communication we're going to talk about is the persuasive, right? 
And this also has a very specific style that you're going to go with, particularly if you're sending out emails that are salesy in, in some way, or if you're telling, sending out information for someone who's asked for that information and you've then got a pitch in there a bit. Well, the kind of stuff I'm talking about, you know, when a customer wants to buy something from you or you're wanting a pay rise from your boss or you're wanting a colleague to finish a task. So come on, mate, get it done so I can get my bit done and we can get out of here. Or you're seeking to get maybe a testimonial from a client or a customer where you're trying to persuade someone to do something which they wouldn't normally do just of their own accord. You're trying to influence or I wouldn't say manipulate, you just want to influence them to take the next step that works for you both, right? So persuasive writing that aims to combat resistance to change because we're humans. We just have this massive resistance to change. It doesn't matter who it is or what it is. We just don't want to change. We get stuck. And the older we get, the more stuck in the mud we get. And we want to show a benefit to them or their business in doing this thing we want them to do. So you're going to break through the fear of change and you want to be able to show them the benefits of stepping through and doing that thing you want them to do. So let's start with a, another email here to Zilv. Now, we want to attract attention in the very, very top of it. So this is a, an activist writing to on behalf of businesses uh, to people in the local area to get some response with them to ask for tax reform for Northern Territory businesses. So to start with, 5,000 businesses are at risk. That's a pretty attention-grabbing headline. Makes sense. You're going to look at that. If you are working for a business in a local area, that may concern you. Dear Zilv, 5,000 small businesses in the territory are at risk from a lack of action on tax reform. So this is immediately setting out and attracting the attention and then getting someone hooked in. These days, we might call it something like clickbait, um, where you're trying to write something, 30 great ways that you can um, use fake flowers to zhuzh up a room and you won't believe number six. That kind of thing is very clickbaity. This is a little less clickbaity. This is just like a hook. This is a standard hook, which is saying, here's something that could be um, a risk to you. 5,000 territory businesses closing down is a big risk. So here's what it means. Now we stimulate a bit of interest by self-interest. So we appeal to the self-interest of the person who's reading it. So those 5,000 small businesses, now we're moving on to making that about them. It might be your local bakery, your child's after school care, perhaps even the hairdresser you've been going to for many years. We've taken a concept that's very, very abstract. So it's very, very businesses and territory. Oh, well, 5,000, there's thousands of others. That's fine. At risk from a lack of action on tax reform. What does tax reform mean to me? You know, does it mean anything to me? Well, it means that if the tax reform doesn't happen, your local bakery could close down that you go and get pies from every day for lunch. Your kids after school care that you are utterly reliant upon because you're a worker and you're a mum and you cannot be having the kids at work all the time. That's going to affect you. And the hairdresser you've been going to for many, many years not a great feeling because we are stuck in a rut. We don't necessarily want to change any of those things. We don't want to change our bakery. We don't want to change our after school care. We certainly don't want to change our hairdresser. So we're appealing to the self-interest of that person, taking an abstract idea of 5,000 small businesses closing to being very much about the world that this particular person lives in. Then we consider to main Attain attention. We want to keep them informed and keep them attentive to this letter. When small businesses are gone, prices go up and that hurts everybody. Now, that particular line is so very well written to then even further cement the idea that tax reform on territory businesses and the closure of those businesses if tax reform doesn't get done will actually hurt you. And it maintains the attention by maintaining the self-interest in there prices go up. We don't want prices to go up and businesses are gone. That hurts everybody. That hurts me as well. The self-interest again is then confirmed. Next, we look at what's desirable or undesirable. So we can present, this is what the good can happen. This is what the bad is. So 5,000 small business territory risk from lack of action on tax reform it might be a local bakery, yada, yada. When small businesses are gone, prices go up and that hurts everyone. For your family, that could be the difference between dealing with people you know and trust or dealing with faceless international corporations. This is good writing, isn't it? It's really convincing. For your family, that could be 
the desirable, the difference between dealing with people you know and trust and the undesirable or dealing with faceless international corporations. You can tell that this is going to be this is going to be a very very convincing email because it's really hitting home all those points that makes it easy for someone to take a concept like tax reform for small business and bring it home to them. If only more political parties knew how to write like this instead of slapping each other, they'd probably get a little bit further, huh? Then you have a call to action because ultimately this is where you want someone to go. This is the complete objective you have for what you want them to do at the end of this email. If for your family, it could be the difference between dealing with people you trust or dealing with faceless international corporations, sign our petition here. That's your call to action to help get our message to the decision makers in Canberra before it's too late. This whole thing, all of that appealing to their self-interest, showing them what's desirable and comparing to what could, what's great about their life now, what could be horrible about their life when things change, gets them in that mood where you can just hit them with, and then this is what you can do about it. So you're presenting a problem, it's abstract, you make it about them, it's no longer abstract, it's very personal. And then you show them that this great thing that you have in your life could be taken away and be replaced by this not so great thing. So you can then go, here's now what I want you to do about it. So you can imagine how many letters are written like this or how many emails are written like this and how effective they could be if they follow a formula that actually takes that problem that you've got as a business and brings it into the world of that customer where they not only can relate to it, but they really, really want to do something about it. So let's recap as we go through here. We're coming into the close and um, I've had no questions so far, but if you've got any, please put them up there. You've got to be very clear about your purpose. Why am I writing this document? Why am I writing this email? Why am I writing this letter? And knowing what do you want the reader to do or know when it's been read. We saw that in the example last one, right? We wanted them to sign a petition, right? Why are you writing it? Because you want to get tax reform through for small business in government. Be clear about your motive. Am I informing? Am I just trying to pass on some information just for the good of them? Am I responding? Am I responding to a complaint or some feedback or to a request for information? Or am I persuading? Am I actually trying to get someone to take a very specific action on this very specific thing that they have contacted me about? And finally, be clear, be brief, be concise. If you've got an email which goes and fills the pain that you can see on your computer and then goes down more and more and more and more and more, you've already gone too long. It's a T what the kids call TLDR, too long, didn't read, cut it down. Halve it and then see if you can halve it again. Oh, but there's so much information in there I need to get across. They're not going to read it. They're just going to skip over that stuff. So make sure you're very clear. Be brief, not abrupt. Excessive words, they waste time. Stay relevant, stay on topic. You're not as a business trying to write an essay or a thesis to, that's going to save the world. You're just writing a way for someone to buy more of your coffee or something like that. Whatever it is you're selling, whatever your product or your service is, that's what you're trying to achieve. Brief, not abrupt. Excessive words, cut them down. Stay relevant, stay on topic. And remember the other thing we had that was really, really important. Don't collapse together the ideas of the facts and the feelings. When you take, take those separately, you can communicate so clearly what the facts are and then you can deliver the feelings and the effect on that later. When you collapse them together, it's what muddies the water. Oil and water don't mix. Treat them like oil and water. Facts and emotions, they don't mix well. They just muddy and they become very, very messy. So I'd like to thank you for joining me this afternoon slash this evening. It's very dark here in Brisbane at the moment and I've got to go out for dinner. So you can contact me if you'd like to talk more about writing for business through danteatreaty.com.au. You can reach out to me on any of these channels, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. I know them all. I love them all and I really enjoy them all. And I really want to thank you for taking some time outside of your life and your business to work on things that are very important for your business. Thank you also to Business Station. If you'd like to book a one-to-one -one, uh, advisory session with myself or any of the other talented people in your state, Queensland, Northern Territory, or Western Australia, 
please uh, reach out to businessstation.com.au. And final reminder, this will be available a little bit later tonight on YouTube as well. Um, time for me to get out and start going to dinner. Thank you so much for joining me and you have a fantastic week. Thank you.